Welcome to Imagination Stage. Here at Imagination Stage, we value diversity and inclusion. And I want to thank you for all you're doing to support students of various needs and abilities. We appreciate your hard work. Inclusion is a belief at Imagination Stage. We believe in every kid and we believe continuously trying over and over again. That is a belief that every child can participate in a class, every child can make a friend in your class, and every child can be successful. A family can come to us in a couple of different ways. The first is that they meet me or they call because they're interested and they want to figure out if we can support their child. The other way is they sign up and they put things on a form that we then find out a lot about. The next step once somebody is signed up is that they get a call, either from me or from the fabulous people that help me out, and we learn everything about that child. An inclusion summary is something that our access department will put together um, that will tell us specifics about a child. Um, it might be a behavior, it might be a physical or cognitive disability, or just something we should know about them. Um, the point of it is to give teachers an idea of who's going to come into their classroom um, and any accommodations that we might make for that student. What they really like, is it Minecraft, is it puppies? We also find out what accommodations help them be successful. Is that a visual? Is that lots of breaks? Is that just making sure it's okay if I move while the teacher is talking? And then anything that might be stressful for that student that's good to know in a room. So if the volume is too loud, or some students it's a really specific fear. They've had a bad experience with a dog maybe, and it's just being sensitive to that so that they can feel successful and not as anxious in your room. Usually I take a look at the inclusion summary after I do my lesson planning. And when I look at the inclusion summary, I'm looking to see who the child is as a person first. I want to see what their likes are, what they dislike. Um, are there any things that I can for sure use to help um, bring an interest further into certain activities or certain moments. And then I want to look at what kind of tools they might need or that I can help bring to my classroom. So if um, I might be looking for something about visuals or something about certain audio cues, certain reminders, uh, those are the kind of things that I want to look at as a teacher. And then I compare that to my lessons and see where I can make modifications, um, what kind of tools I can include into my lessons, do I need to swap anything, and that way I, I use what I've already planned, but I make sure that it's um, applicable and universal for all students. I have a set of tools, a set of exercises, a set of responses ready in case they need them. A lot of times they don't. And then after the first class, after I get a chance to meet them, I'll always refer back to the summary um, and really read it with the point of view of knowing that student and just try to figure out if there's anything in addition that I can do besides just getting to know them and, and what they like and how they can best engage and connect with the content in the class. An inclusion facilitator is a member of your classroom who could either be a teenager, a college student, or an adult. We determine who that is based on that student's needs. Um, so some students are a little socially awkward, have trouble making friends. Putting a really cool teenager in your room is super helpful because that person can help connect that student to other people. If everybody's loving Harry Potter, that teen can connect it for you. If it's an adult, that usually is because a student has a more significant need, either with behavior, with physical support, um, or processing the information in your class. You want to make sure you are treating that inclusion facilitator like a member of your class. So they are not that person's best buddy, they are not that person's shadow, they are also not the only person who should communicate and work with that child. You want it to be a classroom where everybody is supported in doing things. So if your child is doing fantastic and they do not need their IF, your IF is helping with art. Your IF is doing the dance project. A good relationship between a lead teacher and IF is a relationship that is in constant communication before and after class. A relationship where one can check in if one has any questions about what they're seeing in the classroom. So a teacher is the one who is making content, a teacher is the one who is creating the roadmap, a teacher is the one who is deciding the games, who is leading those games, and is also making any kind of material that that student needs. So if a student needs a visual of stop, the teacher is the one who is making that visual. The IF is there to be in the room and be the support. The teacher is the person who's in charge of the content. I am 
communicating with them much the way I would any other assistant. I'm letting them take their moment with a student if they need to take a moment, or I'm encouraging them to laugh and jump with us and uh, model some of the activities just like I would any other assistant um, because I want um, the inclusion facility to seem like a team member and not just there for one child. They're there for everybody to have a wonderful and inclusive experience. Every child's goals are different. So many students who come through our doors are not planning on being the next Broadway superstar. It also means that a child's participation may look different. Uh, a child may need to take multiple breaks. If a child is using a wheelchair, they're probably not gonna be doing a time step. But what does it mean that that student is able to reach the goal of working in time with those steps and also moving with the group? So if a child's in a wheelchair and you're doing dance, can they use a drum? Can other people move them through? Our job is to figure out how to creatively have them making the goal of class, but it not always looking exactly the same. So there are lots of different ways to set up our classes for success. I think uh, one big thing to keep in mind while we're doing this is to remember that all behavior is communication. So any behavior that you're seeing in your classroom that feels undesirable, like running around the room, using a loud voice, any kind of that stuff is communicating something. So it's our job as educators to be able to see what happened right before that is prompting the, the behavior and figure out what that is communicating. No matter what behavior I'm seeing or how a student is acting, I know that they're trying to tell me something. If someone is feeling stressed out, doesn't know what to do, you can offer two choices that are things you would like to happen in class. So it can be, we can try playing the game or we can take a three minute break. I've given two choices on my hands. They're both things I want to happen. A break is fine. It's not a punishment, it's a good thing. But I don't wanna offer, you can try playing the game or run around the room. Because if they pick that one, well, I've given them the choice. I don't want that. And I've offered two choices on my hands. I don't have a third hand, so you can't choose something that's not on my hands. When I make a schedule, it will have all the different activities that we're doing that day. So I'll always have like welcome, check-in question. I'll always end it with some kind of wrap-up or goodbye. But then in the middle, it will depend on what goals we have planned. So when are we doing warm-ups? Which activities are we doing? If we're taking a break, where does it fall? Schedules are great because they ease anxiety. We understand what's coming next. We're all together. And we know that if we're in an activity that we don't like as much, it'll be over and we'll move on to the thing that we do like more. And we can see that our day has an end, that we do go home at some point. It's helpful to lay out the rules at the beginning and even create a class contract altogether. So um, I have some very specific headings of rules and expectations that I like to give students and they all boil down to respect, but then I like to ask them what does that look like. So a class contract is something that we hang up in our room every day. It's something that you can go over at the beginning of every class that everyone sees, understands, and uh, will agree to. So things like listening ears, and you can do motions for each of them, that's really helpful. So we all do listening ears, raised hands, kind words, something like a thumbs up, and safe bodies showing calm, safe bodies in our laps. And you'll notice that this class contract has the words and has a picture, so it's very accessible. You can sign it if you want in the room and then agree to it. I have visuals, I think, for every part of my class. I have visuals for the schedule, visuals for the games, visual for class expectations. Um, and it's not, I think it's just another way to communicate to students um, in addition to vocal directions. Um, it helps, uh, if it definitely helps one student, it's going to help other students. Not just saying the word freeze, because I might not know what that means, but to show the word freeze, nice and big, in a font that we can all read. So this might be Arial or Times New Roman. And with a picture, freeze. Ice is still, and then we practice it. Freeze. So this is something that I can hold up that everyone can see and have a, an auditory cue and a visual cue to know what to do. When I play a game like Bus Stop, for example, I like to make a list on the wall 
of objectives that the students come up with so that when they are playing the game, they're still able to refer to something without having to stop the game and ask or feel like they don't know. It gives every student the opportunity and the access to be successful in the game. If you're still unsure of how to get started making visuals, you can check out our new access kit for inspiration. The kit is a Google Drive filled with things like choice boards and activity visuals, all for your use to edit and print at home. If you don't have time for that, you can check out our grab and go inventory upstairs in the file cabinet. We have tons of some of our most popular items already printed and laminated for your use. We really want this access kit to be something that works for you, so please let us know if you have any questions or suggestions about the kit. You are probably going to get questions from parents. Those questions could be about an inclusion student that is in your room. The important thing is that we are never going to disclose any kind of personal information, either to a student or to a parent. Parents can be really well-meaning. Ah, uh, my best friend's counselor's son has autism. You can tell me, does that child have autism? You're gonna answer this the exact same way every single time. Just like I wouldn't disclose any personal information about your child, I won't share anything about them. Do you have a specific concern that we can address? The key in that is you're not sharing anybody's personal information, medical diagnosis, background, and you're trying to drill down to what that parent is actually asking. Children will ask, why is he so weird? Why does she get a fidget and I don't? How come they keep taking breaks? Uh, these are always moments that we as teachers feel nervous. Formative moment, right? You wanna make sure you teach that inclusion is important. Just like you did with the parent, you're gonna ask a question back. What do you see? Why do you ask? That gives you two things. One, a breath. Okay, how am I gonna deal with this? Two, you are also drilling down to what is that child seeing that is different, that is new, that is exciting. Then you wanna to relate to something personal. So if they're saying, why do they need to take so many breaks? Just like I need these glasses to be able to read our sheet music, they need to take breaks to do well in our class. Simple as that. Isn't it great that we're a class community where everybody gets what they need? The more you embrace being calm with a student, um, the easier it will be for them to identify within themselves what's happening and to help you get, you know, what's going on too. So just always maintain that calm and always approach them with a state of, um, with sort of a state of love. I have many times in my room said, well, that was surprising. And you acknowledge the surprise and you move on. That's teaching kids and it's especially teaching kids when we're being inclusive. Thank you for watching this program. We hope you come by and see our staff with your questions, ideas, and stories from the classroom. We support you.